Don't move, this isn't lunch time yet. <laughs> so you can go. But uh, where is Julianne? Yes. Okay, great, come up. Do you wanna, do you wanna be at the podium? Okay, so before lunch, we have the pleasure of a keynote from Advocate General Cocotte. She needs no introduction, really, but I'll give her one. She is a star judge, very well known in this community. And we've talked about judges and courts at various points this morning, and you've been listening. There's a strong sense that, of course, and we all acknowledge it, the courts are the ultimate bellwether of where things are going. There is also a sense, certainly when one talks to US colleagues, that judges are not quite willing for a host of reasons to adopt a very progressive posture yet. In Europe, it's been somewhat diff different. The, the, the courts, particularly the European courts, have been willing to be quite forward-looking in some respect, even adopting economics, as I was saying this morning, in ways that sometimes are a bit worrying, but at least they are moving with the times a bit. What is your sense for where things are and how judges are going to receive the current drive towards a more progressive agenda? Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for this nice introduction. I'm very glad that I'm here at this wonderful conference, and uh, I got the message, <laughs> if, I, if I didn't have it before already. Um, um, so um, I will now talk on the European Union Court's contribution to addressing market power. Um, due to globalization and digitalization, it has become more and more difficult for regulators to find proper answers um, to the international operations of companies with growing market power. This is due to the fact that uh, regulatory power is usually national or regional, bound to the territory of a particular jurisdiction, as international companies may operate worldwide, regulators have a structural disadvantage. And this is the context in which courts operate and either contribute to enforcement or, as Christina pointed out, may also hinder enforcement. I quote her, still steeped in the previous orthodox, end quote. <clears throat> of course, courts are bound to apply the law. Therefore, courts and legal systems with efficient competition rules are in a better position to keep the markets open than courts um, which have to interpret and apply different type of rules. Nevertheless, it would be naive or even hypocritical to deny that courts have considerable leeway. In interpreting and applying the law, courts may plug gaps, fine tune the rules, and even change the parameters of law enforcement. Likewise, particularly the EU courts have remarkable power to fine-tune the procedural requirements and the standards of proof for establishing um, infringements of competition law. This is very important for, um, for enforcement as previous speakers, for example, Tommaso and John just confirmed. First, I will show um, how the European Court of Justice contains market power. Second, I will discuss how the court, on the other hand, strengthens the defense rights of companies with market power. And third and finally, I will comment on the still unresolved issue of killer acquisitions where the court of justice may have to plug a gap. <clears throat> First, on the court of justice containing market power. <clears throat> The Court of Justice of the European Union has undoubtedly interpreted and applied EU competition law, taking into account the structural deficits of enforcement in a globalized market. <clears throat> Let's take the recent Unilever landmark judgment as an example. <clears throat> 
Their judgment addresses several key questions in the context of the abuse of an undertaking's dominant position under Article 102 TFEU. <clears throat> the Unilever case is exemplary for the extension of the attribution of liability to dominant companies under the notion of undertaking. In the long-standing Atsko Nobel case law on corporate liability of company groups, the Court of Justice recognized a rebuttable presumption of control by the parent company over the subsidiary that has participated in a cartel infringement where the parent company directly or indirectly holds all or substantially all of the capital of the latter. If this is the case and if the counter evidence of a lack of control is not successful, the infringement can be attributed to the parent company without having to prove the effective exercise of control. This initial extension of the liability of undertakings has rendered public enforcement of EU competition law rules with the company groups very effective and deterrent. <clears throat> Later, going a step further, the Court of Justice has extended corporate liability to private enforcement of damage claims in subsequent cases such as Skanska and Sumal in order to protect the subjective rights of the damaged parties. The way, however, in which Unilever addresses, Unilever judgment addresses the exercise of market power is particularly intriguing because it strays beyond a traditional corporation scenario in the light of the notion of undertaking. In the main proceedings of the Unilever case, the Italian Competition Authority found that Unilever violated Article 102 TFEU by applying an exclusionary strategy which was implemented by its resellers. The Court of Justice sided with the theory of harm and stated that also indirect damage resulting from the fact that this company delegated harmful behavior to separate legal entities that carry out its instructions in a sense as an extended arm can fall under the prohibition of Article 102 TFEU. According to the Court of Justice, the distributors are only instruments of the territorial implementation of the commercial policy of the dominant undertaking. That is the case in particular where such conduct takes the form of standard contracts drawn up entirely by a producer in a dominant position and containing exclusivity clauses for the benefit of its products, which the distributors of that product are producer are required to have signed by the operators of sale outlets without being able to amend them unless the producer expressly agrees. In such circumstances, that producer cannot reasonably be unaware that in view of the legal and economic links which it has with those distributors, the latter will implement its instructions and thereby its commercial policy. That's what the court held. <clears throat> The Court of Justice developed its extensive understanding of the notion of undertaking, encompassing large multinational company groups to render the enforcement of EU competition law more effective. This broad interpretation enables competition authorities and the courts to address the cross-border exercise of market power, not only in the jurisdiction where the parent company is established, but in all jurisdictions where those companies actually exercise market power through distributors. Thus, parent companies can be held responsible for the conduct of their legally separate subsidiaries and vice versa, as they supposedly form an economic unit. However, in Unilever, this concept merely serves to impute the actions of formerly autonomous and independent economic operators, namely distributors, to another autonomous and independent economic operator, namely the manufacturer of the products distributed. <coughs> However, as, regard, as regards effective enforcement of competition rules, the Unilever judgment is ambiguous. And now I come to my second point, the Court of Justice strengthening the defense rights of companies with market power. 
In Unilever, the Court of Justice has most recently used its leeway to strengthen the defense rights of undertakings with market power. Their judgment namely extended the field of application of the more economic approach when interpreting the notion of abuse. This does not really further the effective enforcement of competition law, as we just heard from Tommaso, who said, more economics, less enforcement. <coughs> the court had started to take that path, more economic approach, with its famous Intel judgment of 2017. In Intel, the Court of Justice, following its former advocate general and now judge, Niels Wall, had finally ceded to the more economic approach. Applying the more economic approach under Article 102 TFEU renders the enforcement of competition law harder. <coughs> following this case law, competition authorities need to examine evidence undertakings may submit as to the potentially compensatory beneficial effects of, for example, rebate schemes as in Intel. The courts may then have to scrutinize the evaluation of such evidence by the competition authorities. <laughs> the enforcement procedure can therefore become burdensome, even in cases where the restrictions may have seemed evident before. In Unilever, the referring Italian court had asked, in essence, whether the Italian competition authority was required to establish that the clauses in the distribution agreements had the effect of excluding from the market competitors and whether the authority was required to examine economic studies provided by Unilever based on the as efficient competitor test. As in Itel, the Court of Justice reasserted that the abuse concept does not aim to prevent an undertaking from acquiring on its own merits a dominant position on a market, nor does it aim to ensure that less efficient competitors should remain on the market. Under the S efficient competitor test, AEC test, a test initially devised by the, Euro by the European Commission, in its guidance on abusive exclusionary conduct. Um, yeah, by the way, why did the Commission uh, include this test in its guidelines? That's a question which um, I cannot answer because <laughs> um, I wonder why. I really wonder why. So, <laughs> under that test, abuse of a dominant position. Um, can be established as follows. Where the conduct produced or was capable to produce exclusionary effects in respect of competitors that were as efficient as the perpetrator of that conduct, or where that conduct was based on the use of means other than those which come within the scope of normal competition. In fact, the Court of Justice does not require the competition authority to show the existence of actual exclusionary effects to the detriment of competitors in the event that the competition authority establishes an exclusionary strategy on the part of the dominant undertaking, it is sufficient to demonstrate that that strategy is capable of doing so and thus restricting competition on the merits. The Court of Justice added that the use of an as efficient competitor test is in principle optional. Yet, if the results of such a test are submitted by the undertakings during the administrative procedure, then the competition authority is required to assess the probative value of those results. The dominant undertaking can thus require the application of the AEC test by arguing in a substantiated manner that equally efficient competitors would have been able to stay in the market. The court then imposes on the competition authority the duty to carry out the AEC test. And this morning we heard from Rana that the criterion of efficiency is biased towards bigger companies. 
Yeah, in this regard, what is new in Unilever is that the Court of Justice has now buried the old approach under the Hoffman La Roche case law of stamping all vertical restraint practices, such as exclusive purchasing and loyalty rebate schemes, as abusive by their very nature. Ever since Intel, we know that the per se rule has been ab abandoned even for well-known, potentially harmful behavioral categories such as loyalty rebates. There's only little room for the per se rule for manifestly harmful restrictions of competition, such as the so-called naked restrictions. Along the same lines, the Court of Justice has now confirmed this approach in Unilever for the case of non-pricing practices such as exclusivity clauses. The so-called more economic approach is apparently here to stay, ousting reliance on per se rules. Given the high standards that competition authorities now have to meet, competition law seems to be at risk of being underinformed in some cases. That said, a different development can be observed regarding the fundamental distinction between by object and by effect restrictions laid down in Article 101 TFEU. See generics, Lundbeck cases, and my opinions in Servier. I, I fought for that. <laughs> I really fought for that. Under Article 101 TFEU, in order to establish that an agreement or a concerted practice has produced or was capable of producing anti-competitive effects, a competition authority does not have to prove ex post that that agreement or concerted practice has actually produced anti-competitive effects, but it must es establish ex ante that at the time of its conclusion or implementation, the agreement or practice was capable of producing anti-competitive effects. Such a concept of potential restrictions of competition by effect under Article 101 TFEU um, comes close to the capability to produce foreclosure effects under Article 102 TFEU if interpreted rightly. Um, these clarifications on the burden of proof concerning the harmful potential of anti-competitive practices are important parameters as regards the daily enforcement of anti trust rules by competition authorities, as you all know. By figuratively turning the screws a bit more in one direction or the other, the EU courts can considerably influence the modalities of antitrust enforcement and either favor efficient antitrust enforcement or, on the contrary, throw some sand in the wheels of competition authorities. Um, I now come to my short and last third point, which regards killer acquisitions. There the court is probably in a situation um, where it can fill a gap, plug a gap. Yeah, the problematic exercise of market power may not always be sufficiently dealt with by existing rules, and that brings me to the equally important example of addressing market power in the Towercast case, while merger control is to be carried out ex ante, the control of abuse under Article 102 TFEU involves an ex post assessment. The relationship between these two regimes can raise difficult questions when it comes to a concentration operated by an undertaking with a dominant position which meets neither the turnover thresholds of the EU merger regulation nor the relevant thresholds of national merger control law. This can become an issue in particular for killer acquisitions when powerful undertakings acquire emerging undertakings with a small turnover in innovative markets, for example, in the field of internet services, pharmaceuticals, or medical technology, either in order to eliminate them as competitors or to consolidate their specific know-how. However, as laid down in my opinion in that case, this situation is not a legal vacuum, at least not one which cannot be filled. When problematic concentrations are not caught under the ex ante merger control law, the supplementary, supplementary application of Article 102 TFEU is likely to contribute to the effective protection of 
competition. Similarly, Article 22 of the EU merger regulation can offer a solution in such a scenario when a stronger market player acquires a nascent competitor, but neither the union nor the national merger control thresholds are met. A much-awaited much judgment in that regard is Illumina, which discusses the extent to which this provision empowers the Commission to deal with such a case upon a member state request for a referral. The General Court has said that a member state may make such a referral request and empower the Commission to that effect, irrespective of the scope of the national merger control rules. An appeal of, against that judgment is pending before the Court of Justice. And I come to my final remarks. I think those examples have shown how much depends these days on courts. As said, they may either favor efficient antitrust enforcement or, on the contrary, throw some sand on the wheels of competition authorities by strengthening the defense rights of the undertakings. We will also see what changes to effective enforcement the new Digital Markets Act will bring about in terms of gap plugging, as it contains an obligation of the gatekeepers to inform the Commission about concentrations irrespective of whether it is notifiable under EU or national merger control rules. Thank you very much and uh, good lunch. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will not detain people with questions, but I want to recognize you particularly and uh, emphasize some of the key points that you made so that people really take it away, because what you're doing is super important. Number one, one of the things you said is let's be careful. More economic approach means less enforcement. Let's be mindful of that. And the Unilever case and the current Post position we are in in that case, and I am uh, in a sort of quite strange position having advised on that case, is significant in that respect. Number two, the work that you do, you personally, on standards and uh, standards of proof is very important to sort of show the way and not set the standard of proof too high in a way that is unattainable for agencies is important. Three, plug in the gap in uh, killer acquisition where agencies are not probably doing enough is a very strong message. So let me thank you again uh, for this uh, great talk and let's all enjoy lunch. Thank you.